I'm going to give you uh, an overview of what we've done here in San Francisco right now. This is a very difficult time because we are going through a surge and I'll give you an update on that. I will cover some background in history. I will help you understand the transmission of infectious diseases, which I'm calling transmission dynamics. And then I'll talk to you about containment. How do we interrupt transmission? Um, and I'll point you to, to some resources if you're interested in learning more about uh, infectious diseases. So in June, um, this article came out in the San Francisco Chronicle. It was called The Worst Job in, in California, a Public Health Leader. Now, when I started my, my job as a health officer, I never imagined that I would be in this role of actually uh, dealing with a uh, pandemic. And as a public health official, we have to do things that unfortunately, pe sometimes people do not uh, understand. Um, and we get a lot of attention. So when we did our shelter in place order in March, um, over time, it really becomes difficult to deal with when you have to do interventions that really um, at, at another level, really ha harm people. And so that's one of the biggest challenges of, of being a, a public health official, especially at a time like today where we have a public health pandemic. But I would, what I want to emphasize is that for me, it's not the worst job. It's actually the best job. Um, it's an opportunity for me to apply not just uh, inf infectious disease knowledge, medical knowledge, but really to focus on how do we protect and promote health for everybody in in uh, California and, and in San Francisco, with a lot, with a lot big emphasis on social determinants of health. So I actually I actually think it's a it's an exciting job, um, and so maybe there may there's some people in the audience who are interested in entering public health. So as of a few days ago, we've had over 17,000 infections in San Francisco, and now we have over 164 deaths. This is as of December 4th. I want to just review briefly how San Francisco in general has done compared to other areas across the country. This slide here at the very top, you see San Francisco and you see the cases per thousand and the deaths per 100,000. This is as of uh, October 19th. And you see there, for example, the deaths per 100,000, you'll see 14.2 for San Francisco. And if you go all the way to the bottom, you see 284 per per 100,000 for New York City. So we were we were very we were very fortunate and what I want to do is just tell you the story of how we were be we were able to become one of the few cities in the country that really ended up contr control controlling this virus but that the challenges are not over. Some of this is is not really anybody's fault. Some of this is timing. <laughs> Uh, some of this is luck, and some of this is uh, leadership and decision making. This, this, as I, I as I tell people, uh, SARS-CoV-2, the coronavirus, is is a relentless and unforgiving virus, and it's been an incredible challenge. So my journey started back in the 80s when I came to San Francisco General Hospital in 1988 really at the peak of the HIV epidemic. And that was the first pandemic where I got, I got exposed to infectious diseases and how devastating it, it could be. I went on to get training, uh, to get to get more formal training and then got recruited to run a research center at UC Berkeley in public health preparedness with a focus on infectious diseases. And actually within two months of starting my, my role there at UC Berkeley, um, SARS broke out uh, at the end of 2002, uh, and that by 2003, we had SARS-1 really impacting us. SARS-1 lasted about four months, and at that time, I used to think that that was the most frightening uh, respiratory virus that we could face. Um, and people would ask me, well, what could be worse? And I would say, you know, a virus that spreads like the common cold, that has a low mortality rate, and where people, people, uh, we have we have mild illness and uh, asymptomatic infection. And so basically what I was describing as a worst case scenario is is what we currently have. So SARS-CoV-2 is is the worst case scenario in, in, in a sense because 
we have so much asymptomatic transmission, because people get mildly ill, because we have uh, full susceptibility in the population, it it just spreads and it's and it's airborne so it just it spreads like wild and it's very difficult to control it's more contagious than influenza so when i was at berkeley um so i spent a lot of time thinking about infectious diseases and on the right hand side there's a link there to a document if you want to go in and understand this in, in more excruciating detail you can get an idea of how we think about communicable diseases. I'm going to I'm going to just review a few key concepts. Uh, on the left hand side you see what's called the effective reproductive number and the effective reproductive number is how many cases an infection case produces. So if I'm infected on average how many infectious cases am I creating through transmission? Uh, and so you'll see there that formula says RT, which is the effective reproductive number at time T, is equal to R0, which is the basic reproductive number, I'll, I'll review that in a second, times XT, which is the fraction of the population that's susceptible at time T. And that's equal to the contact rate, which is C, between persons who are infectious and people who are susceptible. The D, which is the duration of infectiousness, the small p, which is the probability of transmission given contact between an infectious person and a susceptible person, and then again times the fraction of the population that's, that's, that is susceptible. So you can begin to see where vaccines operate. Vaccines operate on impacting the fraction of the population that's susceptible by making that fraction smaller. There's only two ways that we develop immunity as a population, also called herd immunity, is the path to herd immunity is through natural infection or through uh, vaccination. And we prefer people to become vaccinated because the health outcomes are much more favorable than through natural infection, which causes a lot of uh, disease, disability, and, and death. And there's a lot of things we don't know about, about this virus. So back to the R0, sometimes you'll hear people talk about R0 or R0. R0 is, is the number of secondary cases produced by an infectious, infectious case in the setting of a fully susceptible population with no control measures. So it really becomes the maximum potential for an, an, an outbreak in a population. So you'll hear a lot of people talk about R0. R but what we're what we're really interested in is uh, RT, or some people will call it RE because it's the effective reproductive number. And you'll 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 as I go through as I go through the the statistics, these are the measures that I'm going to be showing you. And and so the effective reproductive number applies to a person who's infected and how many secondary cases are produced. Okay. Then we, we now we're going to look at it from a different perspective. We look at it from the perspective of person who's susceptible. So if you look at people who are susceptible and you look, you say, what is the infection rate of people who are susceptible? It's going to be little c, which is the contact rate between infectious persons and people who are susceptible, times big P, which is the probability of the probability that the person that you're having contact with is infected, so that's the big P, times small p, the transmission probability, what's the probability of the virus being transmitted when I have contact with that person. So these two equations really summarize really the components that we have to be aware, aware of when we're thinking about how we control an infectious disease. If I take these these variables here and I line them up, I will call those control points. And then what we do is we develop strategies on how we address each, each one of those control points. And then the very specific interventions are called control measures. So especially for a novel agent, when you have a novel agent, we think about it in a very holistic way because there's a lot of things that we don't know when there's a novel agent. We don't know what the basic reproductive number is. 
We don't know what the transmission probability is. We don't know the mode of, the mode of transmission. Um, we don't know the reservoir. So in this document, on the right-hand side, there's a lot of concepts that we, we have to try to understand. So I, I, of course, I won't have time to go through all, all the things that are in this document, but if you, if you were to go through this document, you'll see, you'll see things like shelter in place. And shelter in place is one of the strategies that we use to try to interrupt transmission. And so um, uh, I'm going to keep going forward because I'm going to, I'm going to build off this and you'll begin to see, you'll begin to see how this plays out in a real, in a real uh, communicable disease like SARS-CoV-2. So that was, that's my, that's my background. So I had, a, I have had a lot of training in, in infectious diseases and, you know, the, the center that I ran at Berkeley was both a research center as well as a training center. Um, and we, and we, we were preparing for pandemics. And, I, and actually one of the interesting things about when I was running the research center at that time, we were defunded um, at around 2010. Uh, the government decided to stop funding research on public health preparedness, uh, including for infectious diseases, um, which uh, which was very unfortunate. But so there is a there is but there is there's people who are thinking about this and planning for it, but never in our wildest dreams did we imagine that we would be facing what we're facing today. So you know, in Dece late December, we started hearing about cases coming out of Wuhan, China, about a respiratory infection. We're following that information, and I'm using these concepts that I just showed you, and I'm, you know, we're hearing about, we're hearing about what's happening, and we're thinking, uh-oh, this doesn't look good. Um, what, what, what happens is, is that, you know, you have viruses that are in, that are in animals, um, they're rarely transmitted to human beings. And when they do transmit to human beings, in general, the infection stops there. It's, it's, a very, it's very, very rare for, them, for, for us to start seeing sustained transmission in humans. And that's what we were seeing, that this virus that was introduced into the human population, we were reading about reports about sustained transmission in humans. And you hope that it's not it's not so infectious that it, the infection will die out. That maybe it'll be like SARS one, but that turned out not to be the case. So I met with my staff on Jan on January thirteenth. I met with my communicable disease controller, sort of looking at this, and just based on our intuition, just based on our prior experience, we said, you know what, we need we need to start preparing. So one week later, on Jan actually January January 18th here, I'm jogging, uh, jogging uh, up to Twin Peaks, took a picture of San Francisco, came back down, and then on January 21st, I met with our staff and we activated our departmental operations center. So basically, we were we were we were declaring at the, at the health department level, we were declaring an emergency, and some people would ask me, well, why are you declaring an emergency? There's no cases. There's, there, you know, there's nothing to worry about. And we already knew that even if we did not get a single case in the United States, the, pre the preparedness, preparing for this requires a lot of work. So we started, we started, we activated early, early on. Within the next week, our emergency operations center activated. So this is now our whole city infrastructure. Continuing to follow the news, you know, we were screening patients coming back from uh, China, Hubei province, um, quarantine people that, that came back from those areas, following them. So we, on February 25th, we did not have any cases in San Francisco, but San Francisco declared an emergency because we realized, watching what was happening around the world, that we had to even mobilize more resources. And so we declared an emergency even though we had no cases. On March 15th, I got a call from Dr. Sarah Cody, who's the health officer um, from Santa Clara. Uh, early, I, let me let me back up a little bit. Early, earlier that day, that, that morning around eight o'clock, Dr. Grant Colfax, who's the director of health and who's my boss here at the health department, um, he sent me a text and saying, you know what, we need, to, we need to talk to the health officers in the region just so we could coordinate our orders. At that time, we were beginning to implement orders restricting the amount of gatherings. 
we we met in the we met in the morning and we talked about what haven't what haven't we done that might be necessary. So we talked about shelter in place, which other which people also call a shutdown or stay stay at home. And the other thing that we have we had not done was universal masking. So those are sort of two two interventions. And we thought, okay, maybe we maybe we'll do that as a recommendation for the region and you know, we'll talk more about it. Sarah Cody called me a few hours later and she said to us, she says we need to get the barrier health officers together. Um, based on what was happening in Santa, Santa Clara, their cases, their hospitalization, their deaths, ICU admissions, everything was going up. We were following what's happening in, um, in Italy and uh, just some of the studies that were coming out on how explosive SARS-CoV-2 is. Um, Sarah really emphasized to us, not only did we need to do a shelter in place, we, it needed to be an order, we needed to do it as a region, and we needed to do it tomorrow. Um, we agreed, and we actually just got a, an article published uh, describing some of this in more excruciating detail. Uh, we agreed to do it, so that's what we did. We mobilized a team of uh, attorneys, and so by the next day, the whole Bay Area went into shelter in place. We were the first region of the country to go into shelter in place. Within a few days, California, uh, and then New York City went into shelter in place. Uh, New York City um, ended up having a, you saw the statistics that I showed you, and it's really, it's it's not, it, it's, there's a tremendous amount of uncertainty what's going to happen. This virus was completely new. There were many things that we did not know. Um, we were we were lucky. We, we made the right decision, but we also had a big dose of luck because the amount of infection in the community was not was not was not high. New York City did not have as much luck because there had there was a, a significant amount of infection, but they could not see it. You couldn't see it because it's like an iceberg. Most of it is underwater. All you're seeing is the tip of the iceberg. And that iceberg that you could not see was doubling every three to four days. It was doubling in size. That's how rapidly it was growing. And then the iceberg would just um, emerge and you have all those hospitalizations and deaths. And that's what happened in New York City. We were fortunate enough that our iceberg was, was very, very small. So this gives you an idea. So I had mentioned the effective reproductive number. So the effective reproductive number around March 1st was 3.5. So that's 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 essentially how the, the virus is. You can think of that as, as, as its basic reproductive number. You can already see that when we, when we implemented our shelter in place, uh, the effective reproductive number was going down because we had started limiting started limiting gatherings, getting the word out. You'll notice how after we implemented shelter in place, we got it below one. We had a surge in June, and now we have another surge that I'm gonna I, I will cover in this talk. So. Transmission dynamics is really how does that play out in the 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 data that we're the data that we're seeing. So in general, we had we have been doing better than other other counties. There's a tremendous amount of work that goes into implementing uh, infection control strategies. So we spend an enormous amount of time developing. Uh, guidelines and directives on how to implement how to implement the interventions um, and we're very fortunate in the Bay Area that we have even though San Francisco is the second densest city in the country and we really are at high risk for really having a lot of transmission we have both the population and policymakers elected officials who, are, who have been very supportive of the science I, I can't tell you how important that is when your elected officials um, say, "Okay, we don't like what you're recommending, but we're gonna we're gonna support what you're what you're asking us to do." And so we've been very very fortunate, um, and it, we've been able to um, keep rates lower than other places. So even our percent positivity, so the percent positivity is uh, becomes an estimate of that big P that I showed you. The, pro the, the probability that infectious cases is, like, that, that somebody that you have contact with could be infected. <clears throat> unfortunately, unfortunately, what we're seeing throughout the United States 
So if you look back here, this is now the U.S. You look back in March and April, that's really that's really the New York City and some of the places that were highly, highly impacted. But now the epidemic has just, it's just we have it all over the United States. We have over 15 million cases. We're approaching 300,000 deaths. We're seeing over 200,000 200, cases per day, 2,000 2, deaths per day. For every case that's detected, there is six to 10 other cases that are not detected. Most people have no symptoms and they're most in fact, for those that do develop symptoms, they're most infectious two days before they develop uh, symptoms and it's an airborne virus. So that means that when you're breathing other people's airspace, if you share airspace with other people, you can become infected. And that's what makes it so difficult to control this virus. Just gives you an idea of what's happening around around the country as of December seventh. So we we are right now in the in the midst of our Thanksgiving surge. So all those gatherings that occurred over Thanksgiving are now stressing our hospital systems around the country, including California. In addition, there are really uh, racial and ethnic disparities in infections, hospitalizations, and deaths. So this slide just summarizes, uh, for example, among, among cases, among infections, you'll see that Native Americans and Latinx populations have a lot more infections. In terms of people who have worse outcomes once they're infected, it's the African American community. So we have uh, we have a tremendous amount of vulnerability, and you can you can really understand for all the reasons that you would ex you would expect the the racial disparities in health that existed prior to the pandemic are just amplified by this by this pa pandemic. So whether it's living conditions and the Latinx, where there's a lot of uh, crowding in, in in households, or whether it's the African American community that has a higher prevalence of underlying chronic diseases that put them at higher risk of having poor outcomes should they become infected. And this is just another view of the same of the, of the, of the same statistics, same uh, information. I, I, I do want to point out that San Francisco has been impacted very heavily among the Latinx community. We've been fortunate that our African American community has actually done better than most places. And I really have to give credit to uh, the African American community and really the community has mobilized, especially the faith based community has mobilized and really getting the word out and being a very effective and keeping the transmission rates low. So we've been very fortunate in San Francisco compared to other places. So this is California. On the left hand side, you see in California, we have close to uh, over 1.3 million cases. You can see the surge that we're currently in. That slope is very, very high. And we're beginning to see uh, increase in deaths. There are experts, there are researchers in the, in the UK that are studying transmission and interventions around the world. And what their, what their research suggests that once the infection rate gets above 20 per 100,000 per day, it's very difficult to control transmission. You have to do some type of shelter in place. You cannot fine tune it. And I, I can, you know, if you asked me a couple of weeks ago whether I thought I could be very targeted in my interventions, and actually, you, you can go back and look at my talks that I've given before for UCSF. And I set out, I said with 100% confident, we can manage the surges. We will not require shelter in place. Uh, we know how the virus is transmitted. We know what to do. And I was wrong. Uh, this, so it's very humbling. It's just uh, we realize, and I think that's what places around the world have discovered, is that uh, 
once once the virus becomes widespread in the community cuz basically people get infected people get infected either at home in transit at work in social gatherings in schools at, and in worship that's where people are getting infected <clears throat> when when infection is really widespread that means that there's a lot of transmission happening in households once an infection gets into your household, at least a third to 50% of people in the household will become infected. And that's what happens. And so now those people in the household will become infected. If they're essential workers, they then go, or they go to church or they go to work or they socialize, they go out and infect another person that then takes it into another household. And then that household, a third to half are infected. So when it's that widespread, and especially when it's getting into the household, remember we're asking people to stay at home, but at some point, even 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 staying at home is dangerous, and so that's the real ch that that's the real challenge when you have it when you have it this much. Is, so you almost have to think of how do we pull the plug on this virus, have people to s stay home as much as possible, get tested, follow the symptoms, um, and really trying to really trying to interrupt transmission. It's very very difficult. Um, and that's the challenge that we're facing today. And so my thinking has really changed just in the past couple of weeks and recognizing what has to be done. So right now, for example, France had to shut down again. UK had to shut down again. All these countries are learning the same lesson that unfortunately we've had to go to shelter in place. And it's really been hard to get the type of shelter in place that's required because in the United States, there's a lot of political and a lot of public resistance to a, to a full shutdown um, because to do it right you really have to have you really have to have social supports to really support the shutdown you have to replace people the, the lost income that people have so that people can can agree to to stay shut down unfortunately the united states we don't we don't have the political will or leadership at the national level that's going to change but in the past that has not been the case so the test positivity you'll you'll hear about. So the test positivity I'd, I'd mentioned is similar to the big the big P. The probability that somebody is 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 infectious. So here um, it's already in in California it's already going above ten percent already going above ten percent. So that's concerning because that the more the more the more infected people they the more when you have go out there and you have contact with somebody let's say at random. The more that that the probability that a random contact is infectious, then um, that's the, that's that's not that's not good. Especially if we know that they're they're likely not to have symptoms, and that this is airborne. Hospitalizations are going up. ICU beds are going down. So I covered I covered. Uh, national statistics i covered state statistics and so this is now san francisco so there was a time where we were seeing about 25 cases a day in san francisco we're now seeing over 300 cases a day our hospitals are filling up um, our icu beds are filling up and in san francisco as dr grant colfax and Mayor London Breed in their press conference today pointed out, we are going to run out of ICU beds in San Francisco. So we, we, are, we, are, we are in a crisis right now. And, um, and so we're beginning, this, we're beginning this third surge. And so right now we have more patients hospitalized than ever. And right now it's still going, it's still going up. And we don't know when that will stop. I'll, I'm going to go through, I'm going to show you some projections on what may happen. The dark, the dark blue lines is our ICU beds. And you know, one of the challenges is that when the health systems get so uh, stressed like this, is that we don't have the capacity to take care of patients who are, are having just everyday medical conditions. So somebody who may have chest pain, heart attack, asthma exacerbation, stroke, all these things that people depend on their hospital system, our hospital system is not going to be there for the routine 
conditions that require hospital evaluation and, 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 and admission. And it gets even worse. The whole region is affected. So I can't, de I can't depend on hospital systems in other counties. And it gets even worse. We can't depend on hospital systems throughout California. And California cannot depend on hospital systems throughout the country. The whole country, the whole state, and currently the whole region is now in a crisis. So our effective reproductive number is now close to 1.5. And whatever you see in hospitalizations today reflects infections that happened two weeks ago. So we have this iceberg of infected people who are going to be coming up, filling up our hospital beds, and before they get hospitalized, they're going to be infecting another another group of people. So we have this we have this wave coming at us, and that wave is producing another wave behind it that's going to come at us as well. And we're all gonna we're all gonna get crushed with 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 all with all with all these cases. Right now, the estimates of the effective reproductive number for all the Bay Area counties is above one. It, it may sound like a reproductive number of 1.5 is not high, but as you'll see shortly, it is incredibly high. This was just published today in the San Francisco Chronicle. On the left-hand side, you see California and you see the Bay Area. What's important to realize is that in, at Thanksgiving, when people chose to gather at Thanksgiving, probably indoors. Obviously, they had to take their mask off to uh, eat and drink, and there may not have been social distancing. They probably had poor ventilation. And in a sense, people were gathering at the worst possible time, the worst possible time, because infection was very prevalent in the community. And so, and so now we're beginning to see the, the Thanksgiving surge. And as we move forward, people are going to be out shopping. They're going to want to get together for Christmas, New Year's, etc. So in a sense, this is even, this is the, this is the worst time. This is a dark winter. This is the worst time for people to be gathering, taking chances because something that, something that was safe a month ago is not safe today. We have modelers, uh, Dr. Maya Peterson and her colleagues at UC Berkeley School of Public Health. They're able to they're able to take the hospitalizations and actually model projections for us. So based on our current uh, effective reproductive number of about 1.45 when these models were constructed, you can see the dark line there. Is the, me is the median from these simulations. So you can see there it's approaching 1,500 hospitalizations in San Francisco. So that's the number of uh, uh, in, in the hospital on the left-hand side. On the right-hand side, you see the ICU uh, hospitalizations. So this gives you an idea of how many, how many people uh, on what, what, what could be happening if things do not, imp if things do not improve. And so we have to be able to sort of figure out, okay, so what are the implications of all these hospital admissions? Dr. Jim Marks from ZSFG, who's been assigned to the COVID Command Center and, and runs our planning section, uh, and he's, he's, a, he's, an, uh, he, he's a gift to San Francisco. He's been doing, not only is he amazing at running our planning, our advanced planning, doing all these projections, but really understanding in detail how to use this information to what basically is to calculate what we call our runway. So you take this information, the red, the red X's that you see is actual data. That's used to model the projections and the projections incorporates the, bi the biology of what we know about transmission dynamics of this disease from, from, the, from the literature. And so then he's able to take this information with all these assumptions and looking at their current current case rates 
and to calculate out when we would run out. So for example, on the right hand side, you see there that we're scheduled to run out, assuming that things do not change. We're scheduled to run out of acute care beds on January 9th. And you can see that if things continue, that we will be at a deficit, a deficit on February 11th of 400 acute care beds. So now we need to find those acute, uh, uh, we need to find out where we're going to need to find those, where those beds are going to come from. And they're not going to come from other hospitals because other places are worse off than we are. You look at our ICU capacity taking the same approach, San Francisco is scheduled to run out of ICU beds on December 27th. That's, that's coming up very closely. And that we're going to have, uh, we're going to run out of s surge beds. In other words, if we, for example, cancel, cancel all the elective surgery and release all these beds and staff that are available to us, we have an additional 300 beds. We're going to be out of those beds on January 19th. And ICU beds are not something that you can replace. You can't, I, I see ICU care is, is very, it requires uh, a lot of technology and highly trained uh, staff to care for those patients. So we're going to be at a, at a minus 400 bed deficit on February 17th if things do not change. And so the, remember, this is just the tip of the iceberg. Um, I'm not showing you the mortality, but uh, actually there may there may be there may be here. Actually, this one does actually does have the mor the, the mortality. So we we're we're gonna we were if things do not change, we're gonna have over over 500 additional deaths. And remember, this is the tip of the iceberg because we're going to have thousands and thousands of people who are going to be infected, some of whom, many of whom, are going to have permanent damage to their bodies, either their lung, their heart, their brain, their kidneys. And are going to, we're going to have thousands of people who are going to have a chronic medical condition. If you're following the news on people, they call them long haulers, people who are developing um lingering con conditions because of this virus. This virus, from a pathophysiologic point of view, is unforgiving and relentless because it vir virtually attacks, can impact every organ if you become symptomatic. And we do not know the long-term implications, sequelae of having, of, of being infected with this virus. So what is, what is the alternative? The alternative state is that we're able to control this virus, get the effective reproductive number less than one, and on the right hand side is the alternative reality if we can if we can do this. It's going to require everybody. And what I'm telling, you know, I, I, I'm not sure how many people are watching this, but we're asking is that every employer, every hospital system, reach out to your people today and tell them, please stay home. This is the worst time to be out. This is not the time to be out. Stay home and, and, and resist, resist the temptation because for some, for some of our family members and loved ones, this is going to be the last time they celebrate Christmas. This is going to be the last time they celebrate uh, New Year's Eve. This is, how, this is how dire it is right now in California and even here in the Bay Area. So whatever, please reach out to your, your, whatever influence you have. We need, we need more than just the public health officials telling everybody to stay home. All of us have to get our, whether it's, it's, it's your church, it's your work, it's your health system, it's your, it's whatever, whatever social group you have, please tell everybody to stay home for the next several weeks. We gotta get. We have to get this effective reproductive number less than one. Um, that's how we're gonna save lives, and uh, and then hopefully this is the bridge to the vaccine because the vaccines are coming. 
Um, and we don't want somebody to, to die knowing that a vaccine could is just maybe just a few months away from them. I've given you a lot of background information. I've just also covered really what the, the situation that we're in right now. I'm going to, I'm going to take some of those concepts and sort of, and sort of summarize for you how we think about containing this. Um, this is going to be very high level. Uh, but if, but if you want to learn more, there's always, you could always go and, and read some of these documents and, and learn more. But part of it is also to help you appreciate how complex this is. Uh, it's, it's really, it's, it's, uh, it's uh, very complex. I'm going to give you sort of a simple, a simple framework that just comes from quality improvement. And so in quality improvement, we think about, I have a problem. The problem results in consequences. And so and those, that problem has underlying causes. And so if I really focus on that, if I really define on what is the key problem, I think about the consequences and the underlying causes, then I can develop my interventions or countermeasures uh, to implement it for all of this. So that's the framework. It's a very, it's a very simple, it's a simple uh, conceptual framework that you can apply to anything. And and selecting the right, they say, you know, selecting the right problem is the most is the most important. So this is a, a diagram that I, I I created a while back. So the problem is very is is right there in the middle, transmission events. So think about all the places that are where transmission is happening. I already mentioned to you in the home, at work, on transit, worshiping, social gatherings. And that leads to asymptomatic infections, leads to pre-symptomatic, where people are infectious but don't have their symptoms yet. They develop symptoms, they get tested. Those tested become cases that we know about. I'm, I'm moving to the right-hand side. Remember, for every case that we know about, there's six to 10 cases we don't know about. Some of those get hospitalized, some of them recover, and then some of those die. So those are the consequences, those are the outcomes. And then if we move to, if we move to the left, we think about the drivers, the causes. So uh, leaving your home, that's called mobility. Networking is gathering with other people. What setting you're in, indoors versus outdoors. We know that this virus is, is airborne. So what's, is there sufficient ventilation? Is there disinfection of the environment? And then continuing their contacts. Um, what are they doing? Are they eating, drinking, taking off their face covering? Are they washing their hands? And so, that gives you an idea of that on the on the on the top there of all the everything that we're going to do on the bottom to intervene. One of the thing you one of the things you'll realize is that on the left hand side, you'll see next to each driver you'll see the the letter B for behavioral and you'll see E for environmental. You will see that most of these are behavioral. And that's why we need the really the buy-in and cooperation by everybody. And so that's one of the challenges is that it really depends on people's behavior. And, and changing people's behavior is incredibly, incredibly, can be incredibly difficult um, for, for, for obvious reasons, especially at a time where we don't have, we don't have um, the social supports when we're asking for people to, to adhere to our recommendations. This is just another, this is a more formal way of organizing this information. I'm not going to go through it in detail, but you have it there if you want to spend time. At the very top is really, uh, really, the, the, really the key things is mobility, which is basically leaving your household uh, gatherings. And th the emphasis here now is on aerosol, aerosol transmission. I'm going to spend a few minutes talking about aerosol transmission because I think this is, uh, it, it's really important for us to all always realize is that when you're indoors with people, just because you're wearing a face covering, just because you're physically distancing, does not mean that you're fully protected. If you're crowded, if ventilation is not, you don't have good ventilation, remember these face coverings don't prevent, don't prevent all the aerosols from coming out from people's mouth. And those aerosols are going to build up in the air and these face coverings are not designed to protect you from breathing in aerosols. It, it does provide some protection from droplet aerosols, large droplets that are expelled if somebody's not wearing a face covering. 
but it doesn't it doesn't provide the the respiratory protection. So we want people to think about that. We we let people know because if you're older or have a medical condition, if you find yourself to be in a situation where you you're you're going to be exposed, you have no choice for whatever reason um, to think about wearing an N95 as an additional to to go beyond to go beyond uh, source control, which is face coverings, but also respiratory protection to protect yourself because you have increased risk. So in public health, we design our strategies to try to change the average risk, but we also want people to know that you can you can customize your individual risk um, and there are tools to do that. And, and and so actually one of the messages we're trying to get right now is that if you're older and have a medical condition, stay home. Please stay home. So this is just a nice slide I, I like because it does summarize some of this just conceptually um, to realize that the importance of face coverings, the importance of ventilation, and why this is all in, 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 important. Um, and so I, I, I spend a lot more time focusing on the, the, the ventilation because it really is it really is difficult. It can happen very quickly where you're breathing, you're, you're sharing airspace with somebody that may actually not be in the room. Somebody may have been infected. They leave the room, you walk into the room and you don't know that you're breathing aerosols that's, that, 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 care, that have virus. This is this is the la the last slide that I have. This is a very good document to read if you have a chance. It's it's only, if only a few pages long. It's a it really is a really good summary from a public health perspective. What everybody what every every location should be doing. Part of this talk is what what should cities be doing. Um, this document is a, an incredibly good summary of that. I would only strengthen this document by putting an extra emphasis on the concept of airborne transmission. That air airborne transmission requires us to, uh, have to have a more rigorous mindset about diluting air, filtering air, including filtering air that you breathe, including thinking about maybe I need to wear an N95. So the key message that we have right now to everybody is these five key things. Please stay home unless you have to go out for essential work or essential services. Stay home. Tell your loved ones to stay home. Avoid gatherings with persons outside your household, especially if it's indoors. Avoid crowds. Even if it's outdoors, avoid crowds. Postpone travel. And the last one is follow guidelines. Face coverings, ventilation, physical distancing, hand washing, and disinfection. Right now, this is the priority that we want everybody to have. You know, giving this talk right now is, is um, uh, it's, it, 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 we're, 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 this is, this is real. This is not, this is not theoretical. This is real. We're in it, we're in it today. Um, and the next several weeks is going to, is going to, is going to determine whether we were successful or whether we failed at at um, crushing the, you know, flattening the curve. And so we need everybody on board, everybody on board. So hopefully a lot of people will, will watch this and, um, and uh, do everything they can to do their part, to influence every, every, anything that you can influence to really interrupt transmission and to save lives. Well, that was e extraordinarily sobering. Um, but thank you so much for uh, taking the time and we will do our best to uh, disseminate this message uh, with you. Um, so thank you very, very much. Um, one of the questions that uh, came in quickly um, had to do with uh, uh, ongoing health disparities and you know, what are some of the tactics and strategies uh, that we can use in PDSA cycles, if you will, uh, to address some of the ongoing uh, inequality. Yeah, so San, Fr San Francisco, we have been, so San Francisco right now, most of the infection in San Francisco is happening in the Latinx community. So there is, there, there's, a, there's a strong partnership with the Department of Public Health, UCSF. UCSF has been phenomenal. Di uh, Dr. Diane Havlier uh, at UCSF has been instrumental from the very beginning. She hit the, 
she hit the ground running and started setting up testing sites in the Mission District and really documenting that disparity early on. And she's continuing to do that. And she has really sort of figured out an approach mm -hmm. that, that um, where you really have wraparound social services to really facilit facil facilitate the isolation and quarantine of people who are, are in, in, impacted. And the other thing that she's done is uh, she's also been testing new rapid tests to figure out how, how to use it. So the, the community, the Latinx community has been very successful in mobilizing themselves. They are really the experts. And so we're in the process of developing um, uh, funding that can go directly to the community-based organizations who have really have developed the kinds of infrastructure that's required to be successful. But it's very, very hard. It's very hard when you have crowded housing, low income, people have to work. Um, and so it's been very difficult. And this has been an issue across the United, the, the disparities has been an issue across the United States. We're trying to do, we're, tr we're, uh, we're, we're trying everything we can and uh, we need to do more. So it's it's a real it's a, it's 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 an incredible challenge. I did mention earlier that the African American community has been mostly spared in San Francisco, and we and it doesn't mean doesn't mean it it can change. It, this can change. So it's all important for all of us to continue to be uh, to continue to do a really good job in our prevention efforts. Let me ask you uh, two technical questions. Uh, one is uh, and. Um, how do you calculate uh, something like ICU capacity? Uh, in my clinical experience at UCSF, um, the ICU is always full. Um, there's always people waiting to get in, always people in the emergency department and so on. So what, what, what mechanism do you, do you use to calculate ICU capacity? Yeah, so that's a good, really good question. So I'm not, I'm not a hospital expert, but we really, we depend on the hospitals reporting to us, reporting to us how many beds they have, how many staffed beds, because it's not just, it's really not the, not just the number of beds, it's how many beds you can actually staff, and you're, and you're, and you're absolutely right. And so, because those, those beds are going to be full, full of, with people who don't necessarily have COVID. You have people who are having other medical conditions. At UCSF, it's going to be, you know, people are going to be having transplants, for example, but a lot of the, a lot of those beds are also filled, not just people with have acute medical conditions, but they're also people who have had elective surgery, for example, and have to be temporarily through, through the, utilizing some of those beds, depending on what type of elective surgery they're having. So that, that, that's what we, we, what we have. And what we do is we use, we use that capacity to really do our planning uh, because we don't want to depend on the surge. The surge comes from canceling all those elective surgeries, right? So now you're freeing up, you're freeing up beds that can be used for uh, high-level care, and you and you're freeing up staff that can that can that can staff those beds. And then beyond beyond that, then it becomes really difficult because now we're looking for resources outside of the hospital systems, and that's a big that's that's a a, a real big challenge. Right now, we're hoping that if all the systems when they look at the, the runway that's the, the runway that's left, that they cancel all the surgery, open up those beds, including the and, and that we have staff. We're hoping, in theory, that should be sufficient, but it depends on whether there's continuing transmission. So if 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 people continue to get infected, it's not going to be enough. And the state, and that's why we have what are called alternate care sites. So alternate care sites are now sites that are outside of the hospital. And so we have a site over in Presidio that has room for 100 non-COVID patients so that we can, we can offload patients from the hospitals that are non-COVID and can be cared for, cared for there. Thank you. Um, uh, one other technical question. This has to do with the uh, the infection per 100,000 rate. Um, when you see some published data, it's different than what the state uses uh, or the city uses for the uh, color coding classification. Um, and I've been told there's some correction factor. Do you know why the actual rate and the published rates are uh, uh, for staging are different? So. We, we, the state and us both use the daily case rate, but it's averaged over seven days. So you'll see people say seven day daily case rate. 
Um, and then, and then, and that's actually that number is that that number is that number is useful. Uh, and then what the state does is that the state then adjusts it, because part of the challenge is is that different counties operate differently. So there may be a county who decides because of their beliefs that if we don't test people, are we don't have cases. <laughs> So for some for some jurisdictions, there may be a perverse incentive not to test, right? And so one of the one of the ways of incentivizing systems to test is to do a reweighting to do a reweighting to incur to incentivize testing so that people can move along the tiered the tiered system so they can open open things up. And so that's how the that's how the state that's how the state is doing that. So it it gets a little bit complicated. And so we we end up in San Francisco. We end up focusing on the unadjusted rates because the unadjusted rate is more epidemiologically valid. And then with the state, what we do is because we're part of the tiered system, whatever tier they assign us to, we adopt the more restrictive tier. We we adopt the more restrictive tier because we recognize that they're down weighting us. We don't. San Francisco has decided we don't want to be downweighted. We want to be in the tier that's closest to what's true epidemiologically, and so counties may be doing that are, are approaching it a little bit differently. Uh, there's been several questions and a lot in the news um, about the, the state uh, shelter in place as regards to outdoor activities, particularly playgrounds, has been uh, in the news, uh, and of course that leads into the more complicated question of of schools, especially for younger children. And where does the city uh, sit on those? Getting our kids back in school is one of the city's highest priorities. We wanna get kids back in school. In order for us to get kids back in school, we have to bring the rates down. Right now, we cannot, we cannot open up any more schools. Right now, there are schools that are open. The schools that, are, that we've allowed to be open when the rates were lower, we've allowed them to stay open. We cannot open up any rates, any more schools, until we get the rates lower than 14, and then we're able to open up elementary schools with waivers. We would still be in the purple, be still in the purple category. Um, and so that's actually really important. In order for us to get kids back in school, we have to bring the rates down. So that's one thing. Then I know there's been there's been I know there, there was a lot of news about play, about playgrounds. And I think what what happened was is that at the state level at the state level um, I had heard I I I had heard that in Southern California they they were having some challenges with playgrounds that there was a lot of gatherings happening at playgrounds, and so the some of the Southern California counties were um, were asking for playgrounds to be closed. I understand San Francisco has not had that problem. Um, uh, so initially the state decided to close them down. We do think that playgrounds are gonna be lower risk. It's not zero risk because it's not so much that people would, it's not so much that we're afraid of people getting um, infection from really the, the, the playground. The, the structures, it's really that people come together and potentially mix with other households. And so what happened was, is that this, this, the way the state was approaching is, is that we're going to try to remove incentives where people may come and gather from different households at this time where there's so much community transmission. And think of it again as sort of pulling the plug out, it's sort of like rebooting. We're trying to, we're trying to, we're trying to trying to remove incentives for people leaving the household in situations where they may interact with other with other households. I think I know the answer to this question, but what, what is a family to do if the kids are in fact planning on coming home for Christmas? So I so my son, uh, my son, my son uh, came home. And so right now he's quarantined. <laughs> He's uh he's in his own bedroom. He's and this could be challenging. There is guidelines on the CDC on how do you isolate and quarantine when you you can't a actually physically separate somebody, and so it's actually a lot of work because you want that person not to have a you want you want you'd like for them to have a dedicated bathroom. If you can't have a dedicated bathroom, you really want to be very careful about um, uh, bathroom use. I can tell you. So right now he's in his he's in his bedroom. Whenever he comes up to the kitchen, he says, "I'm coming up." And so he gives us a warning. 
uh, but he actually he actually has a, he actually has a, a face covering and he has an N95 because actually what what I told him is that yeah you're coming you're coming home but maybe one of us could be infected so really we have to protect we can't assume that it might be him it might be us right so we have to protect each other we have to protect um, each other from infecting each other so we're actually at home right now we're very we're very very rigorous about it it requires a lot of thought. And that's why it's very difficult. It requires a lot of thought. Open the windows, a lot of, vent a lot of ventilation is really, really critical. Do you think there's next steps that the city can do? Uh, I mean, you talk, you, you're using a uh, carrot here in, in public education. Um, what are the sticks that we should be using as next steps? If, if people are really accepting? You know, I think, we, you know, back in March, in March, we actually closed more. In March, we closed all outdoor activity, all construction, all retail. We closed virtually almost everything except core essential services. So we're, so that's really, we haven't done that with this one. We're, we're you know, retail, all retail is open to 20% capacity. Um, outdoor physical fitness opportunities are still open. Outdoor activities are open. So there, you know, we, we're, we're sort of in this middle road. Um, I know for some people, it feels like we're in a March shutdown. It's not, it's not the March shutdown, <laughs> believe me. Um, and hopefully we, we would not have to go there. I think to do a March shutdown right now would be just very politically difficult both from, from a political perspective, but also from a public perspective because there has to be at the end of the day, there has to be buy-in. People have to uh, agree, and and hopefully we're you know we we no nobody wants to go there. Nobody wants to go there. We're, we're hoping that the combination of education, what we what we're currently doing, plus education, hopefully will do the trick. Um, we have a terrific question about uh, COVID shaming uh, and social stigma um, for people who have been infected um experiencing um shaming and stigma um and i'm wondering how we can message against uh those kind of behaviors and thoughts yeah i think i mean all i think all, all of us just have to sort of recognize is that um you know once people fully recover you know they're not they're not they're not infectious and just like like any like any communicable diseases it's gonna it's gonna take a lot of a lot of education so that people don't uh discriminate um, what are key takeaways so far from COVID-19 that you think could be applied to future pandemics? <laughs> yeah, there are a lot, there are a lot of lessons and there are going to be many more lessons. I think when the researchers go back and study everything, one, one of the big challenges that we've had is that when you think of the HIV epidemic, um, you know, we had decades of research, decades of research uh, to that was put towards the HIV epidemic. Think about COVID, it hasn't even been a year. <laughs> um, so sometimes people say, sometimes people say, but there's no evidence for, there hasn't been enough time to even design studies to answer a lot of research questions. So there is a tremendous amount of uncertainty. So the, one of the ways that we can prepare for future pandemics is to actually have the structures in place to develop the evidence quickly. We, for example, we were able to develop the vaccines relatively quickly because SARS, SARS, when SARS happened, when MER, MER, uh, MERS happened, Middle East Respiratory sy uh, Syndrome, uh, H1N1 pandemic influenza in 2009, there was an infrastructure that was in place, the scientists figuring, this, figuring out how to prepare for the next pandemic. And we know that President Trump, one of the first things they did was to close, close down pand pand pandemic preparedness at the, pre at the presidential level. That's never going to happen again. <laughs> um, so that's uh, th that's what it's going to take. It's going to take inv in investment. It's going to take investment. Um, do you think there could be more strict, rigorous regulations implemented because that people like people are not caring as much as they should? Um, I think I think what has to happen is people have to hear the message from people other than myself. I'm a public health official. I'm the last person people listen to. Believe me, I'm part of the nanny state. <laughs> okay, I, they need to hear from the priest. 
They need to hear it from your friends. They need to hear it from grandma. They need to hear it from other, other, other voices. If, if we just depend on public health officials, it's not going to work. They have to hear it from other trusted sources. All these behavioral changes seem to rely on some level of collective consciousness and empathy among strangers. Are there, are there any governments or organizations coming up with successful communi camp, commu communication campaigns in this arena? Um, I'm, I'm hoping um, that's very difficult because uh, our country ideologically is very divided. Um, and I think that's just one of the challenges that we have so that, uh, and you see this with climate change, you know, climate change, unfortunately has gone, you know, fighting climate change has, has become associated with one party. And I think it's been real difficult. We have to, we have to really learn how to, how to, um, how to figure out how, how to change that because it makes it difficult because whatever one party decides is, is the truth, the other party decides uh, it's not the truth and it becomes a real issue. I don't have a quick answer for you, but I do have references. If people want to read more, I can, I can share later. If you spray alcohol, will this cut down the possibility of transmission? So from, from a disinfection point of view, coronavirus is pretty easy to, do, to clean. So basically, even though coronavirus does survive on surfaces, pretty much regular disinfection does the trick. So, in general, fomite transmission is going to be uh, is going to be a small a small proportion of transmission. The biggest impact is going to come from focusing on airborne transmission. That's where people really need to put their efforts. Uh, I, I don't understand this one. How risky is I think is a surgical procedure. I have scheduled tomorrow. Um, I don't know what procedure you're having, but the health systems have been really good about taking precautions. Um, so I would not worry about that. I think that the healthcare systems have been very good about doing everything they can about tra preventing transmission inside hospitals. They're very good. Um, contact tracing has been very effective in Asia. Is it possible to institute that? So we have a lot of contact tracing and it, it, it does work when infection rates are low. When infection rates get so big, it doesn't work because there's too many people that are infected. If four people, two from each household, agree to quarantine for 14 days, uh, can those people safely gather indoors for a period of hours on a single day? Yes. So if you, if you really, if you really have, if you have people who really, who really actually qu completely quarantine, completely quarantine, and 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 have not been exposed, have not had any exposures. It's unlikely that they're going to be infected, and and if they're going to have interactions, that would that would definitely make it that would definitely make it safer. You can apply these principles. It's 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 hard for it's hard for people to do that though. But if if people are willing to do that, please take advantage of the of the, these tools. Um, why aren't gloves required in public? Um, yeah, so um, you know, gloves don't necessarily keep you protected because. Gloves get contaminated, and then people t touch themselves. So, uh, and in general, people don't wash gloves. So, in general, the most important thing is really not the most important thing. The most important thing is to worry about your airspace. Airborne, airborne, airborne. That's the most important thing. And then, when you do think about your hands, yes, hand washing is really important, and hand awareness because people touch their face hundreds of times a day, um, and so you have to be aware of that. Uh, can Sam? Can can San Francisco projections be generalized to other counties? Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. Um, and that's being done for, for counties across California. Um, yeah, it says here, how do we get those of us who have money to start paying for the vulnerable to stay home? Yeah, this is really, a, uh, the government, uh, un the government needs to step up. We need, we need government support. This is, a, this is an important role for government. Um, to provide the social safety net so that we can implement a good shelter in place strategy. Do you think that San Francisco was well equipped and prepared to handle this kind of emergency in comparison to other cities and counties? You know, I, I think San Francisco is, is better resourced than most counties, that's true. But I would say the biggest difference has been the tremendous support from our elected officials and in general, the public. I can tell you early on back in March, I had so much support. I just, it made my job uh, a lot easier. I, I hear from a lot of public health officials in many other parts of the country that don't get that kind of support. 
where they, they're threatened, they're scared, people protest in front of their house, they get death threats. Uh, we're very fortunate in the Bay Area. I can't tell you how lucky we are in the Bay Area. Um, so thank you for everybody in the Bay Area. And so, now, um, but we could still do more. I just wanted to thank everyone for their attention tonight. Uh, this has been a very sobering a message from a true expert and public servant. And I really want to express my appreciation to Tomas Aragon for his, uh, all of his work during the pandemic and, and for being here uh, tonight with us. And again, I wish everyone a safe uh, holiday season. Uh, take this seriously and uh, we'll reconvene in February. And uh, I wish you all the best and Tomas, uh, thank you so much.